questions. First question, Honorable Dennis Kwok. Thank you, President. President, Article 22.3 of the Basic Law stipulates that all officers set up in the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region by departments of the central government or by provinces, autonomous regions or municipalities directly under the central government and the personnel of those officers shall abide by the laws of the region. Moreover, Article 63 of the Basic Law stipulates that the Department of Justice of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region shall control criminal prosecutions free from any interference. In this connection, will the government inform this council, one, whether it has studied if the president of the officers set up in the S Hong Kong SAR by departments of the central government offices in Hong Kong who have committed the following acts have breached the laws of Hong Kong. One, offering any advantage as defined under the Prevention of Bribery Ordinance to any public servant as an inducement or to to or reward for the public servants performing or abstaining from performing any act in his capacity as a public servant. And two, soliciting or accepting any such advantage as an inducement or to reward for the performing or abstaining from performing any act in relation to the affairs or business of their offices if it has studied of the results. Two, whether it has studied if advantage as defined in the POBO includes one, the appointment of a person to an official position on the mainland, for example, a deputy to the National People's Congress or a member of the National Committee or a local committee of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, and two, an undertaking or act to provide assistance to a person for his appointment to an official position on the mainland, if it is studied of the results, and three, whether it has reviewed if the existing legislation is adequate for imposing criminal sanctions on those who have committed the following acts. Public servants soliciting or accepting deferred benefits, such as post service appointment to an official position on the mainland, and those personnel of CG officers in Hong Kong offering such deferred benefits to public servants. If it has of the details, if not, the reasons for that. Chief Secretary for Administration. President, the question raised by the Honorable Dennis Kwok involves the understanding, interpretation, and application of legal provisions. It is of paramount importance that any deliberation on whether a legal provision is applicable to a specific situation should be based on relevant facts and evidence. Generalized discussion is inappropriate and should be avoided. Furthermore, the application of criminal laws is a matter for the court in, in order not to prejudice the fair and effective administrative of criminal justice. It is not appropriate for the government to make any overly specific comments outside the judicial process. Subject to the aforesaid, the government's reply is as follows. Part one of the question. There are different laws in Hong Kong that govern different categories of corrupt conduct. Statute law includes the prevention of bribery ordinance, the ordinance. According to section four, bracket one of the ordinance, any person who, whether in Hong Kong or elsewhere, without lawful authority or reasonable excuse, offers any advantage to which the ordinance refers advantage to a public servant as an inducement to or reward for or otherwise on account of that public servant's performing or abstaining from performing any act in his capacity as a public servant may commit an offence of offering advantage to a public servant. In addition, by reason of Section 9, Bracket 1 of the Ordinance, any agent who, without lawful authority or reasonable excuse, solicits or accepts any advantage as an inducement to or reward for or otherwise on account of the agent's doing or forbearing to do any act in relation to his principal's affairs or business may commit an offence of soliciting or accepting advantage by an agent. Section 2 of the ordinance stipulates that an agent includes a public servant and any person employed by or acting for another. With regard to the office set up in the Hong Kong SAR by departments of the central government and their personnel, Article 22.3 of the Basic Law stipulates that such officers and personnel shall abide by the laws of the Hong Kong SAR, including the POBO. However, it should be emphasized here that regardless of what bodies or persons are involved in a case, whether or not the relevant conduct is in breach of the laws of Hong Kong depends on the specific circumstances relevant evidence and the applicable laws in each individual case. There is no place for generalization. Part 2 of the question. Section 2 of the ordinance defines advantage 
as to include any office, employment, or contract, and any offer, undertaking, or promise, whether conditional or unconditional, of any advantage such as office, employment, or contract. Whether advantage, as defined in the ordinance, includes an official position in Hong Kong or in the mainland or overseas, depends on the specific circumstances. Relevant evidence and the applicable laws in each individual case. Again, there is no place for generalization. Part three of the question: Deferred benefits is neither a term of art used in the legal context nor a term that is found in the ordinance. Under section four, bracket two of the ordinance, any public servant who, whether in Hong Kong or elsewhere, without lawful authority or reasonable excuse, solicits or accepts advantage as an inducement to or reward for or otherwise. On account of his performing or abstaining from performing, or having performed or abstained from performing any act in his capacity as a public servant, may commit an offence of soliciting or accepting advantage by a public servant. The offence of offering advantage to a public servant is also stipulated in Section Four, Bracket One of the Ordinance. A public servant who solicits or accepts advantage and performs or abstains from performing, or has performed or abstained from performing any act in his capacity as a public servant, may commit the said offence. As mentioned in Part Two of my reply, whether advantage, as defined in the Ordinance, includes a certain official position, and whether deferred benefits constitutes an advantage, as stipulated in the Ordinance, depend on the specific circumstances, relevant evidence, and the applicable. Laws in each individual case. There is no place for generalization. Thank you, President. Mr. Dennis Kwok. How many times does the administration have to commit a wrong? How many problems would have to occur before you would tackle this issue of deferred benefits? This is not something new. It started with Lung Chin Man, and then in the recent Timothy Tong case, the re- public's uh, worries are that after retirement they may be given a position. Or be appointed to a public office, and there is a problem of deferred benefits. This is about high-ranking officials, and the CS4A also said that, in fact, her words alone cannot really brush away the public's worries. With regard to the reply, I like to ask this question: Would the administration take a square look at deferred benefits? And seek to amend the POBO or ICAC regulations so as to put an end to public. High-ranking officials、uh, getting positions or appointments after retirement. CS4A. Thank you, President. I do not agree with Mr. Dennis Kwok saying that in dealing with anti-corruption work,、uh, there are any mistakes or errors. What is important is that we have clearly defined laws and also investigation bodies with high credibility. And also, as Mr. Dennis Kwok said in his question, that there is. A prosecution procedure free of interference, and I believe anti-corruption work in Hong Kong in these three aspects is done adequately. Ms. Sitho, thank you, President. I'd also like to ask about deferred benefits. This is not a term that has appeared in our ordinance, but it is real. It is reality. Mr. Long Chin Man took up a job after retirement, and officials could not brush away that problem, and therefore now. There is a so-called cooling period. It is an administrative measure put in place to prevent that from happening again. So, CS4A, if you do not want to face up to the worries caused by deferred benefits, it is already an inadequacy on your part. So, CS4A, my question for you is: Do you have the determination to put an end to the worries or questions raised by the public arising from deferred benefits, so that the administration is embarrassed? Would you consider expanding? Uh, the scope of regulation about post-retirement employment for high-ranking officials, for example, that you also include accountability officials, even CE himself, and also statutory bodies like the SFC and also the ICAC, in addition to、uh, civil servants. CS4A. Thank you, President. As I said in the main reply, deferred benefits, whether that would constitute. An advantage under the POBO. It has to depend on the specific circumstances, relevant evidence, and applicable laws in each individual case. In enforcing the ordinance, what is important is that there must be a credible law enforcement agency, and that our criminal prosecution must be free of interference. Therefore, we have no plans to do what Ms. Sitho suggested just now. President, my question was not about existing laws. 
I have already、uh, agreed with her that this is not a legal issue. My question was whether you would expand the scope of regulation, and that is from civil servants. You would also include CE accountability officials and even statutory bodies, including the ICAC and SFC, and uh, the uh, principal officers. In other words, whether there would be more people netted into the scope of regulation. CS in the POBO today. With regard to designated officers and public officers, there are already very clear interpretations. Mr. Alan Leong. With regard to the facing up to deferred benefits, actually, in recently recruited civil servants、um, system, there is already no pension for these people. Therefore, when you say you pay them high salaries so that they would not try try to chart a path for post retirement employment, I think that does not apply anymore. So, after the change in the situation, CS, would the administration consider doing this about civil servants? And that is, if civil servants would try to prepare for getting deferred benefits after retirement, will you? Consider writing a guideline for doing a study into this area. CS President, thank you. In terms of the probity and integrity of civil servants, we have never only relied on the pension, as suggested by Mr. Allen Leung, that the pension is sufficient protection. He says that without the pension system, we do not have sufficient、uh, safeguards. However, in the CSB, we do three things to. Ensure the probity and integrity of civil servants. First of all, the system itself and continuous improvement to the system in order to do corruption prevention. Two, we do civil service training, and three,、uh, we have penalties, which are not only confined to the deduction or stopping of payment of pensions after retirement. Therefore, we already have a very effective three-pronged approach. To ensure the integrity of civil servants, but as I said, the system can always be updated and revised. The CSB will react to、uh, incidents or special experiences and update and review the system. As I said in my main reply, with regard to the ex ICAC commissioner. And his entertainment expenses.、Uh, there were some irregularities, and the CSB, together with the administration wing, has already done some review, and guidelines have been updated. The work will continue. With regard to the Hansard of this council, I like to clarify the CS answer to my supplementary. I like to confirm this point. My question was. Whether you would target newly recruited civil servants who are not protected by the pension system, whether or not you would review the situation and analyze the situation and write a new guideline in face of the new situation, what is the CS reply? CS, my reply is clear. We will not consider whether there is pension or whether there is no pension in order to tackle the integrity of civil servants'、uh, issue. Mr. Tam Yu Chung, allow me to quote from Article 21 of the Basic Law. It says, "Chinese citizens who are residents of the Hong Kong SAR shall be entitled to participate in the management of state affairs according to law, in accordance with the assigned number of seats and the selection method specified by the NPC. The Chinese citizens among the residents of the Hong Kong SAR shall locally elect deputies of the region to the NPC to participate in the work of the highest organ of state power." According to the regulation for returning deputies to these state organs, if I participate in the election of deputies, if I stand as a candidate to be a deputy, or I vote for a certain deputy, how can that be linked to what the question says here? And that is the definition of advantage under POBO. I think the two are really far apart. Is that the case? Yes. Thank you, President. I agree with Mr. Tam Yu Chong. That is why, in my reply, I said that we should not link these matters together. I think it is appropriate, and also without a specific case, we should not generalize. And in fact, Mr. Tam Yu Chong may know 
that with regard to civil servants who have left the service, our regulation is that within a control period, if they accept outside work, they should approve. But then there is general approval for a scenario, and that is when retired civil servants serve in non-commercial organizations without pay, and that would include state organs or organs of state power. Mr. Albert Ho, President, of course, the NPC deputies are returned by small circle elections. It is not a direct appointment system. But let me not mention the NPC. Let me mention the CPPCC. Very often, there is recommendation and nomination. I think you remember, CS, uh, earlier on, Liu Meng Hong actually asked Mr. C. Y. Leung to recommend him to be a CPPCC deputy. And I'm talking about such matters. Would such recommendation be a kind of advantage? I understand that in part two of the reply, the CS says it depends on the circumstances of each case and there is no place for generalization. That I understand. That is common sense. But my question for the CS is, if there are people holding official positions and they promise other people that I will recommend you to be a CPPCC de deputy, but you as a public officer, you do something for me in return. Now, I'd like to ask this question. Would that possibly constitute a breach of the POBO? CS. President, Mr. Ho is someone in the legal sector. I hope he understands that I cannot and should not comment, comment on individual cases. And I also should not comment on scenarios. Just now you said very clearly that your question was based on if. Uh, you asked if this should happen, whether that would be a breach of the law or that would be an irregularity. So pardon me for not giving a reply here. I hope Mr. Hill will also understand that, as I said in the main reply, I am not giving a reply here because I like to safeguard the fairness and effective uh, operation of our criminal prosecution procedure. Uh, sorry, I think the CS has heard me clearly. I'm not asking her whether that is a breach. Uh, as a legal sector person, I know how the law applies. I'm asking her whether there is a possibility of a breach. So can she not say whether it is possible or not possible? CS, any supplement? Thank you, President. Whether it is a breach of the law, it depends on the circumstances of each case, the relevant evidence, and also the applicable laws. I think uh, my reply to Mr. Ho will be like this. I'm only asking whether it is possible. Uh, why is it that she has not heard the word possible? Uh, Mr. Ho, I think the CS has already answered your question. If you are not happy with her replies, you can follow up on other occasions. Mr. Ng Leung Singh. Thank you, President. I'd like to ask the CS this question. After civil servants retire, very often they actually take up deferred work, just like a high-ranking officer of the police force engaged in a lot of voluntary work after retirement. They are excellent examples. Should we not compile a record of such and ask them to promote such by way of training and education for incumbent civil servants. Let them talk to incumbent civil servants about anti-corruption practices and uh, what they have gained from deferred work after retirement. CS, thank you, President. Mr. Ng Leung Singh's suggestion is a good one. In fact, there are numerous retired civil servants who engage in community work. And their knowledge and experience has benefited society through such social work. I will take this up with the CSB. Dr. Den uh, K. K. Kwok, Mr. President, the CS reply has not answered the main issue. As we know, uh, the state organs in Hong Kong, like the liaison office, they have many privileges. As you know, they talked about core security areas. And also the ex-ICAC commissioner, uh, Timothy Tong has thrown uh, banquets 
for Chinese officials in Hong Kong. In the end, he is a C CPP CC deputy. Mr. Dennis Kwok asked about whether any studies has been done. You have not answered that question, and you are not treating the issue seriously. So how can you say there is not a problem? My question for the CS is, since you hope that there will not be any offer or accepting of advantage. So in the future, will you take the initiative to do this about people who have been NPC deputies, ICC, IP, CPPCC deputies, and, uh, and those who aspire to be such deputies, and also people in the uh, state organs? Uh, will you advise them or even warn them that they should not break the laws of Hong Kong so that uh, anti-corruption work in Hong Kong can continue. CS, I, President, I think Mr. KK Kwok's question uh, has included unreasonably targeted comments, and I can only give a general reply. First of all, I will not comment on the cases you mentioned. Secondly, as I said in previous replies, to safeguard Hong Kong's anti-corruption image. We need a credible law enforcement agency and also criminal proceeding, uh, prosecution proceedings that are free from interference. And uh, these conditions exist in present-day Hong Kong. So I don't think studies need to be done or review or any changes need to be taken. President, my question was very clear. I said whether you should also issue advice or even warnings. You did not address that point. Can you be clearer in your reply? CS, yes, any supplement? In the government minute, I already said that to preserve Hong Kong to be a clean city, public education is important, and that is why the CRD of ICAC will continue to work in days to come in order to promote anti-corruption messages, including uh, conducting public education. We have spent almost 22 minutes on this question. Yeah. Question two, Ms. Chen Yun-Han. Thank you, President. In the past decade or so, quite a number of local cultural and arts workers have rented industrial building units for use as studios. On the other hand, the government announced in 2009 a set of revitalization measures to facilitate the development and wholesale conversion of old industrial buildings, that is, the revitalization measures, which have been implemented since April 2010. The results of the survey on the current status of industrial buildings for arts activities and future demand, released by the Hong Kong Arts Development Council in 2010, indicated that the revitalization measures had activated the transactions of industrial building units, posing problems such as increase of rentals and termination of tenancies to quite a number of cultural and arts workers who had set up studios in industrial buildings, and that situation was most acute in Kowloon East. In this connection, will the government inform this council? First, whether it has conducted any survey on the number of tenants, vacancy rate, and average rental of industrial building units in each year, since the government announced the implementation of the revitalization measures in 2009, of the measures taken by the authorities to assist those cultural and arts workers affected by the revitalization measures in coping with problems such as increases in rentals and termination of tenancies. Second, whether it has conducted any survey on the number of studios set up by cultural and arts workers in industrial building units in Kowloon East and the average percentage of the rental expenses against the total income of such studios in each year since 2008, whether the authorities contacted the cultural and arts workers affected by the revitalization measures and conducted related studies in the past three years so as to understand their difficulties and needs, if they did, of the details, if not to the reasons for that. And third, whether it will conduct a comprehensive survey on the current uses of industrial building units in Kowloon East, as well as those throughout Hong Kong, including the businesses of the tenants, the users of the units, etc. If it will, of the timetable, if not the reasons for that, whether it will conduct a review of the impact of the revitalization measures on the cultural and arts workers with a view to formalizing formulating development plans and policies for industrial areas which can better meet the actual needs of the stakeholders. Thank you, President. Secretary for Development. President, Honorable Members, good morning. The government announced in October 2009 a series of revitalization measures to facilitate the, develop the redevelopment and wholesale conversion 
of old industrial buildings with a view to providing more floor space to meet Hong Kong's changing social and economic needs. These measures have been implemented since the 1st of April 2010, and the deadline for submission of applications is the 31st of March 2016. Subsequently, refined measures were implemented in April 2012 and February 2014. As at the end of January 2014, the Lands Department had received 119 applications under the revitalization measures, of which 90 applications had been approved, and the relevant projects could provide about 979,000 square meters of converted or new floor space. The objective of the revitalization measures is to better utilize the precious land resources of Hong Kong through encouraging the redevelopment and wholesale conversion of existing industrial buildings. The measures have to take into account the needs of the economic development of Hong Kong as a whole and also the aspiration of the owners and users of industrial buildings, which is market-driven. The government does not target at or tilt towards any particular sector. Applications for revitalization involve new uses in various areas, including the use of place of recreation, sports or culture. Upon completion of conversion of the industrial buildings for such uses, floor space can be provided for the use of cultural and creative industries. As for the demand for space from the art sector, the administration will provide support and assistance as far as possible through measures such as those under the Arts and Cultural Policy and District Development Initiatives. The Home Affairs Bureau, the HAB, has been supporting and promoting arts and cultural development from the policy perspective. And the Hong Kong Arts Development Council, the HKADC, has also been actively exploring more room for creative endeavors through partnership with different parties. My reply to the various parts of the question is as follows. For parts one and two, according to the information provided by the Rating and Valuation Department, the RNV Department, the overall vacancy rate of private flat factories had dropped from 8% in 2009 to 5% in 2012. At the end of 2013, the average rent of private flatted factories on Hong Kong Island, Kowloon and the New Territories were respectively $150, $163 and $101 per square meter. The average rent for private flatted factories have been rising in recent years. And the rate of increase between 2009 and 2013 is broadly comparable to the rising trend in average rent for private offices, private retail premises and private domestic units. As for the support for the arts, the HAB and the HKADC have been working closely with different sectors to promote arts development in Hong Kong. With funding support from the HAB, the HKADC launched an ADC art space scheme by leasing about 10,000 square feet of floor area in a building in Wong Chok Hang at below market rate. Under the scheme, art studios will be made available for leasing to local visual and media artists at affordable rental fees. Fitting out works for the units are expected to be completed in the middle of this year. The HKADC is also working in collaboration with the Taipo District Council to study the feasibility of converting a school premises in Taipo, which will soon be vacated into an arts centre. In parallel, the government also encourages the development of cultural facilities in support of artistic endeavours by community organisations. For example, the Jockey Club Creative Arts Centre in Chekit May, which has 103 studios, operates on a non-profit making mode to provide space for artists with policy support and rental subsidy provided by the HAB. As for Kowloon East, the Energizing Kowloon East Office, the EKEO of the Development Bureau, has kept contact with the arts and cultural sectors from time to time, for example in organizing workshops, to understand their views on the better utilization of vacant government land for creative arts and cultural uses during the transformation process of Kowloon East. The EKEO has also partnered with artists and designers in place-making activities, such as the 12-week Playful Thursday at Chun Yip Street. In the Fly the Flyover 01 project, 
The open space underneath the Quinton Bypass is converted into an informal cultural and performance venue and is open to the public for organizing, among others, cultural and arts activities, music performances, and architecture and planning exhibitions. To understand the operation plans and concepts of non-profit making organizations on better utilization of the space underneath the flyover for creativity, arts and cultural uses, the EKEO launched a market-sounding exercise at the end of last year. By making reference to the result of the exercise, the EKEO will invite proposals from interested parties later this year with a view to identifying the most suitable operator as partner to operate the unused space underneath the flyover. As for part three of the question, my reply is, the planning department is now conducting a new round of area assessments of industrial land in the territory which will include sample surveys of the private industrial building units in the industrial areas through Hong Kong. In addition to the users of the units, the survey also covers the business nature and number of employees, etc., of the unit users. The purpose of the assessment is to examine the usage patterns of the existing industrial sites and to explore whether the sites are suitable for converting into other more appropriate uses. Apart from factors of individual districts and sites, the overall demand for industrial land will also be considered. The entire assessment are expected to be completed within this year. The EKEO will continue to explore opportunities to, pro to provide space for the creative industries and arts and cultural and arts community. These include optimizing the use of the remaining plots of flyover sites and exploring the possibility of incorporating space for cultural and art uses into existing and new premises. Thank you, President. Ms. Chen Yunhan. President, I really want to say, Secretary, you really don't understand the situation. As for the content of your reply, strictly speaking, it's rubbish. If, have, if you understand what young people are doing in Kowloon East, then for energizing Kowloon East, the young persons are underneath the flyover objecting to planning by the government. They objected to any planning by the government. For Kowloon East development and energizing Kowloon East, they say they're targeting everybody, but in fact, they're destroying a lot of things, including arts endeavors. You're using the market to drive these industries. With this bulldozer, you are destroying the creative artists in Kowloon East. For the CE and the secretary, how should you direct and guide young persons? The SARG must think about this directly. There are creative young persons put under high rentals, and they're forced to resist and object to government planning. Ms. Chen Yunhan, please ask your question. If the government does not think of solutions, it will be a failure. I'd like to ask the secretary to have a creative industrial factory park and to promote creative industries. Do you have any plan to do all those? Originally, I did not want to ask this question because I was afraid that he would not know how to answer. But after listening his reply, I was very annoyed. So I'm asking this. Well, you have already asked your question. Please be seated. Thank you, President. Secretary, as I said in my reply, President, in revitalizing industrial and factory buildings, the government is not tilted towards any sector. As for arts and culture, as well as in creative industries, just now in my reply, I already cited quite many examples about the government's work. We keep an open attitude. Together with councillors and relevant industries, we'll explore what should be done. And in promoting energizing Kowloon East, we're trying to see what more can be do to help them, as I said in my main reply. Thank you, President. Mr. Christopher Chung. Ms. Chen Yunhan, what's your question? The Secretary has not answered my question. Please repeat your question clearly, clearly. I asked uh, whether the Secretary can take the lead to have a creative park for industrial and factory buildings, and will you promote creative industries? Of course, the Secretary is not familiar with these issues. Please be seated to have asked your question. Secretary, I've already answered the question. I have nothing to add. Mr. Christopher Chung, I just left the Hong Kong ADC, 
I am also disappointed with the Secretary's reply to Ms. Chen Yunhan's question. He said that his policy is not tilting towards any sector of the community. For those originally working in factory building units, that's a very beautiful but brutal misunderstanding. You are forcing these creative artists to nowhere. There's nowhere they can go. Will the government want to force them to their death or extinguishment? If not, is there any vacated space in government premises? And what about vacated subways or space underneath flyovers so that they can use such as workspace for exhibiting their works? Secretary, in my main reply, I cited the example of Kowloon East. We've been making Kowloon East, that is, the open space under Kuntong Bypass, for the use of uh, performance artists and creative artists and workers. That is known as Fly the Flyover 01. And there are two other f similar premises to that end. As I said in my main reply, we're doing some surveys, and after these surveys, we'll find out interested non-profit making organizations to see what ideas they have. Then we'll invite proposals from them so that we can identify suitable partners to work in these two sites to serve the relevant communities. In Kowloon East, there are two action areas with government facilities and premises. After the relocation of these facilities, we can explore the development of those two sites to see whether any space can be used for the development and use of such workers and whether there are opportunities for them. Mr. Ma Fung Kwok, thank you, President. On revitalization, factory buildings. My feeling is that in the past few years, the government has been evading, evading the adverse effects of the policy and the impact on the art sector. In the government's reply, a lot of things have been mentioned. Number one, Ms. Chen Yunhan mentioned the ADC survey. At that time, the government's response was that that was not an accurate survey. But several years have passed. For example, in paragraph two of the question, is clearly asked whether it has conducted any survey on the number of studios set up by cultural and arts workers in industrial building sectors to understand their difficulties and needs, if they did, of the details, if not the reasons for that. However, in the reply, only three examples are mentioned. First of all, the Creative Arts Centre in Shekhet May happened before the revitalization measures. And then the ADC surveyed this 10,000 square feet floor area, which was not implemented. As for the refurbishment of the Thai pole premises, government approval is yet to come. So in the past three to four years, what has the government done? I can only say to the affected artists, uh, nothing is done for them. The government has n not shown its care for them. So how is the government to respond to the remaining parts of Ms. Chen Yunhan's question? What has the government done? That is, in understanding their needs, what has the government actually done? Secretary, President, as I said in my main reply, in EKEO, our colleagues have actually contacted the art workers and performance artists in the district in different ways and on various occasions. As I mentioned in my reply, there's this vacated space under Kuntong, Baipa, Kuntong Bypass, and we're trying to see what uses can be put on it. And then under our plan, we're having another round of a survey on industrial sites throughout Hong Kong. We're going to conduct sample surveys not just to find out the users of those premises, but the business nature and the number of employees employed. All these will help us further grasp the present situation and then make plans. Apart from such implementation efforts, 
through the revitalization measures for creative industries and their workers with provided space. Take Hollywood Road, former police, married police quarters as an example. That project has already been completed. At the moment, we are recruiting users of creative studios with 130 creative studios. We expect that by the second and third quarters of this year, they'll be using the space. Now, those are creative spaces for artists. I can say that under all the revitalization measures and policy objectives, we have not targeted or tilt towards any particular sector of the community. The revitalization measures aim at making use the precious land resources of these industrial and factory buildings to address the social and economic needs of society. We're not just talking about creative industries. We're actually doing a multifaceted policy, and all these will affect the market to a certain extent. Mr. Chung Kok Pan, thank you, President. In paragraph three of the Secretary's reply, he says that the planning department is now conducting a new round of area assessments of industrial land in the territory, which will include sample surveys of the business nature of the existing users as well as possible changes of users. Finally, he said that he would consider the overall demand for industrial land. I'd like to ask the Secretary, what's the progress of that exercise? Apparently, there's not much open consultation. Without open consultation, you won't be able to know the need of the art and culture sectors and those of the creative industries, as well as the needs of the industrialists coming back to Hong Kong. No open consultation, right, Secretary? Secretary, President, this task is to grasp the actual situation, so we're still in a study period. Your question not answered? Not answered, President. Secretary, the Honourable Member is asking for the time frame and whether or not you'll conduct public consultation. President, we envisage uh, that we can complete the assessment within this year. And then upon the completion of the assessment, we'll be able to grasp the actual data and statistics, then we'll formulate our next step. Mr. Chong, the Secretary is saying that we should wait for his assessment to be completed, but he has not done public consultation. He does not know what the sectors and industries want. Well, the Secretary has already heard you. Ms. Alice Mack. President, in the Secretary's reply, he mentions a number of times that he will look at the market situation and the impact of the revitalization measures and there are economic needs. Now, my question is clear. For art and creative industries and government support, Secretary, does the government have any support for the creative industries? Apart from the revitalization measures, are there any other policies? Just now in the main reply, the Secretary focused on Kowloon East. You mentioned the space underneath flyovers. I can say that that is only part of energizing Kowloon East. But the problem does not just lie with Kowloon East. It occurs in other districts as well. Now, Secretary, throughout Hong Kong, what policies do you have, I mean land policy, to support the development of art and creative industries? Ms. Mack, in Ms. Chen Yunhan's question, he is asking about Kowloonese. Secretary, for Ms. Mack's question, any answer? President, for the territory-wide policy, I mentioned the HAB in my main reply. The vacated school campus in Taipo will be put to use very soon. And then in Wong Chok Hang, we'll have uh, a certain floor area to be rented to the creative industries at an affordable rent. So the situation is already included in my main reply. We've exceeded 22 minutes for this question. Question three, Mr. Christopher Chung. 
President, the Development Bureau announced in June last year that a site of an area of merely 476 square meters at the junction of Oitek Street and Oikan Road in Shao Kei Wan will be included in the land sales program of the current financial year. The site will be put up for sale by open tender on the 21st of this month for private residential development. Some residents in the district strongly oppose the arrangement, pointing out that the Diminutive waterfront site provides a maximum permissible gross floor area of merely 4,287 square meters. And that the new building, which will be very close to Tong To Court and Oi Po House of Oi Tung Estate, will obstruct natural lighting and ventilation of inland buildings. In this connection, will government inform this council A whether before offering the aforesaid site for sale by tender, the authorities have studied the impact of the new building on the ventilation in the area, access to natural light by the lower floor units of the buildings nearby, and the property prices of the neighbouring estates, and the issue of the area of that site being possibly further reduced due to a 12-metre diameter underground sewer discharging to the sea, if they have conducted such a study. And um, the outcome shows that the new building will not impact on the surrounding environment of the justifications and data. If not, how do authorities know whether the plan has any impact on the residents in the vicinity? B. Given that in a consultation document issued in September last year, the LTHS steering committee suggested building single-block public rental housing buildings dedicated for singletons. But it has been reported that some members of this council, the district council members and members of the public oppose the idea of constructing buildings by making use of every, uh, every single inch of space. And the consultation report um, will be released in the first quarter of this year. While the authorities have decided to offer the Oitek Street site for sale by tender on the 21st of this month without waiting for the release of the report, whether it is assessed that the authorities have fully considered public views in making the decision to call for tenders if it has assessed of the outcome and see, as I have learned that before proceeding with reclamation at the location of the site and its vicinity in 1999, the government has made an undertaking to the Eastern District Council that the reclaimed land would be used only for providing subsidized housing and community facilities rather than developing private housing. Whether the government has assessed if it has reneged on its undertaking by putting up the Oitek Street site for sale for private residential development. Secretary for Development. President Thank you. housing is a livelihood issue which is one of the prime concerns of the community. Tackling the housing problem is one of the priority tasks of the current term of the government. To meet the public's strong demand for housing, government has to increase the supply of land for housing de development. Government is adopting a multi-pronged strategy to increase land supply in the short, medium and long term through the continued and systematic implementation of a series of measures, including the optimal use of developed land as well as practicable and creating new land for development. One of the major sources of supply is the government's various ongoing land use reviews, including review of the government land being vacant or under STTs. In the past, Legco and the community requested the government to make optimal use of such land as far as and as quickly as possible to meet the community's pressing demand for land. The residential site at the junction of Oikan Road and Oitex Street in Shao Kei Wan is a piece of vacant government land zoned residential group A in the approved Shao Kei Wan Outland Zoning Plan number S. H916. Residential development is a use always permitted in the zone and is in line with the planning intention. When considering whether the site should be used for residential development and included in the land sale program, government consulted relevant departments to ensure that there was no insurmountable problem for residential development on the site. The site was included in the 2013-2014 land sale program in June 2013 and um, will be disposed of by open tender between the 21st of February and the 4th of April this year. My reply to the three-part question is as follows. 
A. In the preparation of the OEZ piece, the planning department carries out relevant assessments to confirm the feasibility of relevant land use proposals. The site has been zoned RA since the mid 1990s. When the town planning board amended the Shaw K1 OEZP in 2008, building height restrictions for various zones were incorporated. In formulating such building height restrictions, planning department conducted a visual appraisal and an air ventilation assessment for the proposed restrictions within the zones concerned. According to the AVA report, the site does not fall within any major breezeway or ventilation problem area. Besides, building designs of private residential Developments shall comply with the provisions of the building's ordinance, um, including the uh, relevant provisions on air ventilation and natural lighting. Government has also promulgated the Sustainable Building Design Guidelines to facilitate air ventilation. There is a single cell storm water box culvert of around 3.5 meters wide in the northeastern part of the site. Government will designate the drainage reserve area in the northeastern part of the site as a non building area in order not to or in order to ensure that the existing underground drainage facilities will not be affected and to address uh, the uh, as concerns of local residents about the potential impact of the proposed residential development on the surrounding areas in terms of landscape, air ventilation, and access to natural light. This arrangement will not affect the remaining area of the site for residential development purpose. B. The site is a piece of vacant government land and is not located within the lot boundary of any housing estate. The destination of the site for private Residential development is unrelated to the views of the LTHS steering committee on constructing single block PRH buildings on suitable sites within existing PRH estates. The government has made use of various channels to explain the designation of the site for residential development to Ledge Co members, district council members, and local residents, including several written replies to the inquiries raised by Ledge Co members, district councillors, and residents. The departments concerned, including the Lens Department and the Planning Department, also met some legal members and district councillors and the representatives of the residents in September and October last year and attended the meeting of the Planning, Works and Housing Committee of the Eastern District Council held on the 18th of October last year. The departments concerned explained to members and the residents the planning and land issues relating to the site. As mentioned above, the drainage reserve area in the northeastern part of the site will be designated as a non-building area to address members and residents' concerns about possible impact on landscape, air ventilation and access to natural light. C. The land created through the Aldridge Bay Reclamation is mainly used for housing, school and open space development. As for the RA zone within the reclamation area, its planning intention is mainly for high-density residential development and there is no restriction on the types of housing development. In fact, the existing housing developments on the reclaimed land of the Aldridge Bay um, Reclamation include both public and private housing. In a nutshell, the site is a piece of government land and housing development on the site is in line with the planning intention and requirements of the OEZP concerned. Given the current acute shortage of land and housing supply, we should optimize the use of every piece of developable um, land, in particular conveniently located urban sites. The housing development on the site can help meet the public's strong demand for housing in urban areas and benefit the community as a whole. Thank you, President. Mr. Christopher Jong, the Secretary for Development, President, um, in uh, para A of his reply, said that according to the uh, AVA report, the site does not fall within any major breezeway. Now, 
I want to say that yesterday the residents um, came to the complaints division and told uh, electrical members that the AVA was um, an AVA for the entire Shao K1, not for this particular site. And we have Oipo House right adjacent to the site, and we're talking about 100 meter, um, 100 meter of um, uh, buildings with a walled um, effect. And um, this um, um, proposed building will further aggravate the air ventilation problem. Will the Development Bureau carry out a detailed air assessment um, um, or air and ventilation assessment before um, disposing of the site? Um, uh, Secretary, I think I'll not repeat what has been said in my main reply, President. Now, in fact, we've responded to the concerns of the residents, President. As I stated in my main reply, um, there is a um, sewer uh, on the northeastern part of the site, and uh, this area will be a non-building area. And you can see that visually speaking, uh, uh, as this is a non-building area, uh, the air will be able to reach uh, the inland. And so uh, we have no intention to carry out uh, further um, AVAs. Thank you. Mr. Ari Lee, thank you, President. I understand that there is a need to identify suitable sites to increase land supply and housing supply. But then concerning um, um, how the government handles the site, um, um, there are lots of concerns uh, from the residents. We have to make sure that the uh, Bureau can really address their concerns. In fact, I have all along been um, liaising with the residents and the residents' representatives. And one of their main concerns is this. In February 2011, um, the sustainable um, building uh, document was issued, and um, there were the sustainable building design guidelines promulgated by the government. And the residents are of the view that um, in this case you haven't complied with the guidelines. So have you uh, looked into this matter, and how can you make sure that the uh, building to be constructed will be um, in conformity with the guidelines? And how can you make sure that there will be um, uh, adequate separation um, b uh, between buildings and also adequate permeability. Secretary, thank you, President. As stated in the main reply concerning housing development on this site, um, it will be no different from um, private housing development on other sites. In other words, um, the developments have to satisfy uh, the provisions in the building's ordinance, including provisions on air ventilation and natural lighting. And um, the proposed development will also have to comply with the sustainable building design guidelines. In fact, I have already said several times that um, the northeastern part of the site um, uh, where there is a uh, single cell storm water box covered uh, will be um, a non building area. And so we have tried to address the concerns of the uh, uh, nearby residents with regard to possible impact on ventilation and natural lighting. Mr. Sin Chong Kai. Thank you, President. In fact, um, the administration uh, always uh, goes back uh, on its promises. Now, uh, in the debate uh, to continue uh, later this afternoon, um, the, uh, the government is also going back on its promise. Now, concerning uh, Tong Tho Court, um, Tong Yuk Court, now, according to the uh, Lease um, the uh, site would be uh, used for public transport facilities, but um, now you want to go ahead to dispose of the site. So is it that um, the government is again going back on its um, previous promise, Secretary, President? In twenty o six, the uh, pro. Post uh, minibus terminus, um, uh, or, or, uh, or that uh, proposal was scrapped in 2003. The transport department uh, carried out a, a review on the uh, RDS, um, the um, public um, demand for uh, public transport services, and. Um, uh, other aspects, and so concerning public transport planning, concerning the minibus terminus. The um, it was um, relocated to the Sai Wan Ho PTI in June 2006, and um, the um, 
interchange um, has been able to provide uh, accessible, convenient public transport services for the public. And so the site has been um, vacant since then. As I've stated in my main reply, there is a great demand for housing sites, especially um, housing sites in the urban area which are easily accessible. And so we really make to make optimal use of the site. Uh, my question has not been answered. Please repeat your question that has not been answered. So I, I, I asked whether the government was again going back on its promise to the residents because um, in the uh, sales um, uh, brochures um, when the flats were sold, um, it was said that the site would be used for the provision of public transport services. So I want to know whether the government is uh, um, going back on its promise. At that time, uh, the government promised uh, the residents that the site would be used uh, for public transport services. Um, Secretary, I don't think I've got anything to add, President. I've already given a reply. Dr. Kenneth Chen. Yes, thank you, President. Now, the uh, Secretary um, is stubborn. He insists on his own way. Uh, but then the Civic Party will, together with the residents, continue to ask the government to stop calling for tender. Now, this for this uh, conference room is about 80 um, square, um, uh, square meters uh, in area. And then concerning that site, uh, if you... Um, um, have to provide for a non-building area, then that site, uh, in fact, will become even smaller. And we're talking about uh, a building with 40 stories, 120 um, meters. Um, President, uh, the Secretary mentioned the Sustainable Building Design Guidelines in his main reply. I want to know whether the guidelines can apply to this very uh, special site. It's a very, very small site. I believe the guidelines only apply to a, a site which is um, um, two hectares or a, a bigger and for buildings extending uh, for a length of 60 meters or beyond. Um, Secretary. President, thank you. Yes, sometimes um, we may come to um, different uh, judgments and conclusions on the same facts, but then um, I, uh, in, uh, uh, in the debate on the policy address last week, I pointed out to members that um, in the past um, there were sites which were smaller than this site, and um, those uh, had been disposed of, including a site uh, last year in Kun Chong and also um, another site in Wan Chai some years ago. And um, in the OZP concern, there are height restrictions, and that's 120 MPD. And so. Um, Mr. Chan said that uh, the building uh, would exceed uh, 40 stories, and I don't think that's really um, um, uh, the real situation. In June last year, President, we included a site into the land sales program. After that, we on many occasions received letters from legal members and district councillors. We gave replies to all those letters, and as I stated in my main reply, we um, went to the district. We explained the situation to district councillors and the residents. And as I have said before, um, the northeastern part of the site will be a non-building area. That's to address the concerns of district councillors and the local residents. So in my view, we have tried our best to address the concerns of all parties. So is it your question has not been answered. Uh, my question has not been answered. President, now, concerning the sustainable building design guidelines referred to by the secretary in his main reply, do they apply to the site, which is um, less than 0 0.05 hectare in area? Um, President, I've got nothing to add. Thank you. Um, Mr. Paul Chair, um, I understand that we need to work our policies to suit the needs of the times. There is an acute shortage of housing sites. I can understand why the government is adopting such an approach, and the uh, Secretary has explained this approach many times. And my uh, question relates to um, uh, part three of the reply concerning the uh, pledge given uh, uh, to um, uh, the Eastern District Council with regard to the Aldridge Bay Reclamation. I want to know whether there was such an undertaking given to the Eastern District Council. Has the Secretary for Development um, dug up um, the relevant documents? 
Now, if、uh, there is such an allegation made, then、um, the member making such an allegation should provide the proof. Now, can um. Now,、uh, on the old rich rate reclamation area, we have um, 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 let's say so on as well, and uh, so as uh, so we we can see that we have both private and、um, public housing developments on、um, the reclamation side. So I would like to know whether you've done any research uh, into uh, whether the government has given an undertaking to the Eastern District Council concerning the old rich rate reclamation site.、Um, President, I just want to say that if、um, a member、uh, wishes to make such an Allegation. He or she should provide the proof. Mr. Sin Chong Kai,、um, does the、uh, administration really need any proof provided? Because、um, I believe when a former district council chairman、um, made the complaint, he or,、uh, or she must have、um, done some research. So, what's your question, Mr. Sin? Now, in fact,、um, um, the residents understand that、uh, suitable housing size should be used for housing development, and the residents have suggested that、um, low-rise buildings should be built on a site, and、uh, maybe a, a, a care and attention home should be provided. So, would the development bureau and other departments actively consider the suggestion? Yes, Secretary,、um, President. Now my colleagues have、um, searched the records, and the records show that we uh, haven't uh, given、um, the undertaking、uh, referred to by Mr. Paul Chair just now. And in fact, as I have said just now,、uh, at the moment on the reclamation, there is a private housing development, and that's La Saison. Um, we've assessed、uh, the situation, and we are of the view that this site is、um, most suitable for housing development. Thank you, Dr. Kenneth Chan. Thank you,、um, the Secretary. In his reply. Said that、um, the government、um, uh, asked relevant departments to ensure that there was no insurmountable problem for residential residential development on the site. Now,、um, you know,、um, for residents of Oitong Estate, Tong、um, Tok、uh, Court, and so on and so forth, they、um, have jointly、um, uh, opposed、um, the idea of housing development on the site, and they've also、um, filed an application to the town planning board. So, I want to know how、uh, do you think that some、um, uh, there are Objection is a surmountable or insurmountable problem,、um, Secretary President. Town planning board procedures are open and transparent procedures, and the town planning board is an independent body. Any person can um, um, propose or make planning. Applications to the town planning board now concerning、um, the、uh, planning application referred to by Dr. Kenneth Chan. In fact,、um, it should have been dealt with by the town planning board in December last year, but then the hearing has been postponed upon the request of the applicants. And according to the information um, um, provided by the um, residents, um, that the Aren't any new grounds for applying for a deferral? Now, in fact, anyone can um, um, make a planning application to the town planning board. We have this site, which can be used for housing development, and is it that we should shelve the、um, housing plan because of a planning application made by、um, cert a certain person? Now,、uh, we don't want to see people making use of certain proceedings and procedures to delay our. Housing programs. I'm not referring to this case. I'm not accusing the residents in this case of doing this. But I just want to say that we must、uh, take note of this possibility, and that is, we should not allow people to make use of certain procedures or proceedings to delay our、uh, projects. Now we will in the.、Um, Land disposal conditions、um, make it very clear that there are town planning board applications、um, going on, and as a result, those interested should seek their legal advice and understand the risks they face. Question four, Mr. Felix Chung. Thank you, President. According to the standing employment contract contract for employing foreign domestic helpers (FDH) 
Employers have to de provide their FDH with free passage from Hong Kong to their places of origin on termination or completion of the contracts. Some employers of FDH have relayed to me that some intermediaries for FDH uh, intermediaries and FDH have seized the opportunity and collaboratively abused the arrangement for premature termination of contracts and change of employers, commonly known as job hopping. They have employed various tactics to make the employers initiate contract termination with the FDH so that the FDH may receive the money for the passage and the intermediaries may charge new employers for placement service. However, instead of returning to their places of origin, such as FDH have such FDH have departed for Macau, Shenzhen, or other neighboring places and then re-entered Hong Kong to work, given that job hopping by FDH causes psychological and financial damages to the employers and that the problem has become increasingly serious. Will the government involve this council one? Whether the authorities will consider not issuing new employment visas to FDH who have had more than two employment contracts terminated prematurely within the 12 months prior to their visa applications, if they will, of the details, if not the reasons for that. Two, whether it will review and amend the immigration ordinance to strictly require FDH to return directly to their places of origin within 14 days upon premature termination or completion of the contracts with the employers, and to permit employers to monitor if the FDH have actually left Hong Kong, if it will, of the details, if not the reasons for that. And three, whether it will consider upon the request of a prospective employer of an FDH and with the consent of the FDH concerned, providing the prospective employer with the information kept by the Immigration Department on that FDH employment history in Hong Kong, including the places of work and duration, as well the reasons for leaving, etc., in respect of each of the previous contracts, for reference, so as to combat job hopping by FDH and prevent prospective employers from falling into traps of job hopping FDH in order to enhance the protection for employers, if it will, of the details, if not the reasons for that. Secretary for Security. President, my reply to the Honorable Chung's question is set up below one. The Immigration Department, MD, has all along been processing employment visa applications of foreign domestic helpers, FDH, in a rigorous manner. If the applicant has any adverse records or breaches, MD will consider refusing his or her application. Clause 12 of the Employment Contract of for a Domestic Helper Recruited from Abroad, the contract, provides that the, in, in the event of termination of the contract, both the employer and the FDH shall give the Director of Immigration notice in writing within seven days of the date of termination. A copy of the other party's written acknowledgement of the termination shall also be forwarded to MD. These records will be kept and taken into account by MD in considering any future applications made by the FDH for an employment visa or extension of stay. Under the prevailing policy, change of employer applications for FDH in Hong Kong within the two-year contract will not normally be approved except under exceptional circumstances. Example, if the FDH contract is terminated on grounds of the transfer, migration, death or financial reasons of the employer, or if there is evidence suggesting that the FDH has been abused or exploited. The applicant must provide proof to satisfy MD that his or her application meets the above circumstances in order to be approved to change employers in Hong Kong. Regarding the abuse of premature contract termination arrangements by FDH, MD has adopted a corresponding measure to strengthen the assessment of employment visa applications of FDH who change employers repeatedly. MD will, in processing the employment visa applications of FDH, closely monitor closely scrutinize their case details such as the number of and reasons for premature contract termination within 12 months with a view to detecting any abuse of the arrangements for premature contract termination. If MD suspects such abuse, the application will be refused. From the implementation of the above measure in June 2013 to January 2014, MD received about 40,000 employment visa applications from FDH, of which 1,372 were suspected of job hopping, accounting for 3.4% of all applications. After closely scrutinizing these applications, MD refused 170 of them. 
Another 158 applications were withdrawn by the applicants or required no further action. MD believes that this measure helps to deter abuse and re review its effectiveness from time to time. 2. Clause 7 of the contract stipulates that on termination or expiry of the contract, the employer shall provide the FTH with free return passage to his her or her place of origin. The rationale behind this requirement is that the employer, who hires the FDH to work in Hong Kong, has the responsibility to pay for the FDH return passage in order to ensure the FDH smooth return to his or her place of origin upon the completion or premature termination of the contract. Otherwise, the FDH concerned may be stranded in Hong Kong owing to the lack of means to travel. The same requirement also applies to other employers who hire foreign workers from overseas to work in Hong Kong under other labour importation schemes. The administration has no plans to change the prevailing policy. Although the contract does not stipulate the form or deadline of the return passage provided by the employer to the FDH, we suggest that the employer provide an air ticket for travelling from Hong Kong to the FDH's place of origin to fulfil the contract requirement instead of giving a cash amount equivalent to the value of an air ticket. Also, to avoid additional losses, employers may consider providing their FDH a more Reason flexible air tickets, such as one without a specific deadline or one that allows change of travel dates, as there may be unexpected circumstances where the FDH is unable to travel on the date specified on the fixed date ticket, example, discount tickets. Unless he or she falls under the exceptional circumstances mentioned in Part 1, an FDH working in Hong Kong who wishes to enter into an employment contract with a new employer must leave Hong Kong and submit a new employment visa application to MD. In processing the employment visa application of an FDH to work for another employer after premature contract termination, MD will conduct a movement record check to ensure that the FDH has left Hong Kong before the new visa is issued. If the applicant to is suspected to have any adverse records of breaches, including abuse of the employment arrangements for FDH, MD will consider refusing the application based on individual circumstances. Three. Under the FTH policy, MD's primary function is to process FTH employment visa applications and to consider whether the applicant fulfills the relevant criteria and the normal immigration requirements. It is not MD's role to provide FTH's background information to prospective employers. If employers wish to obtain information pertaining to FTH previous employment in Hong Kong, they may contact the FTH former employers with the consent of the FTH and the former employer in order to learn more about the FTH performance. Employers may also refer to the employment visa and entry stamp or lending slip on the FTH travel document, old employment contracts, etc. Furthermore, the employment records of FDH, including the time of employment and reasons for quitting, constitute personal data under the Personal Data Privacy Ordinance Camp 486. Any persons making a data access request to government departments to access another person's personal data must comply with the requirements stipulated under the ordinance. As mentioned in Part 1, MD has all along been processing FDH employment visa applications in a vigorous manner. If the applicant or his or her employer has any adverse records or breaches, MD will consider refusing his or her application. Thank you. Mr. Alex Felix Chong. Thank you, President. On the question of F FDH, and the practices of intermediaries. The, the two are closely related. Now, in the recent case of an Indonesian uh, FDH being abused, the Labor and Welfare Bureau says that it's going to come up with new policies that may review the existing system on uh, that uh, would be, they would consider um, imposing license conditions on uh, intermediaries or um, penalizing um, intermediaries breaching any rules. Now, what uh, are the details of the l new policy and what is the latest progress? Secretary for Labour and Welfare. Mr. Felix, thank you, Mr. Chung, for your question. Now, of course, licenses are issued by the Director of Labor, uh, the Commission of, of, for Labour. If uh, any intermediaries breach any rules, uh, we could revoke the license, take up prosecution, or refuse to renew ni licenses. Last year, there were nine cases 
involving intermediaries breaching rules. Uh, two, uh, six uh, intermediaries were convicted. Uh, three, two cases are still being heard in court. And, yet, and we've also stepped up inspection last year. We conducted 134 inspections. And after that case, it's true, the Bureau and the Department are now actively considering whether to further tighten regulation or Im improve upon the regulation. Uh, we, uh, we haven't come uh, uh, make any decision, but uh, we're considering several possibilities. One possibility is to include certain conditions in the licensing condition. Uh, first of all, intermediaries must not be involved in any uh, borrowing arrangement because it's uh, during borrowing that a lot of problems come up. A second uh, possible condition is that uh, intermediaries cannot um, collect more than 10% of wages as commission. That point is clear already in the law. And the third possibility is that if um, um, the intermediaries have the duty to keep in liaison with um, the FDH working in Hong Kong from time to time, make sure that there are no problems with them. So we are now considering the feasibility of all these uh, suggest uh, proposals, and um, we will come back to the panel to listen to your views. We will also consult the sector. It's a uh, thank you, Yik. Thank you, President. My question is for the Secretary for Security. In part two of Mr. Felix Chung's question, uh, he asked the sec uh, Secretary whether the immigration ordinance will be amended to strictly require FTH to return directly to the places of old region within 14 days. It will add to the cause and it could stop job hopping. But then the Secretary said that, um, well, an employer should just buy them ticket and not give them cash. Perhaps the Secretary is not aware of that. In the uh, p uh, point one of the uh, in um, the the question, uh, Mr. Chung mentioned collaborative abusing of the uh, arrangement and so on. So if we go by the secretary's suggestion, we just give them air uh, an air ticket but not cash. It would just um, mean they could make less. That's all, but it won't stop job hopping. So uh, what you suggest would not work. Would you consider again amending the immigration ordinance so Hong Kong people wouldn't fall victims to such cases? Secretary for Security, if I may give um, some information by way of background, Mr. President, please allow me to do so. Before the 1st of uh, March 20, uh, 1987, all FDH who came to Hong Kong could only work for a designated employer as they came to Hong Kong. Before that date, uh, we saw some cases, some cases, that um, some FDH um, terminated their contract with employees and they stayed in Hong Kong because uh, in those days there wasn't a requirement for them to leave Hong Kong within 14 days. That led to a host of problems. And so, after the 14th of March 1987, the government changed the policy. There's an additional condition in the contract. It, that is, upon the termination of the employment contract, uh, either termination by the employer or the employee, the relevant FDH must leave Hong Kong within 14 days. That is a that was aimed at stopping or reducing job hopping. The, the issue of concern to Mr. Felix Chung and Mr. Frankie Yick. Now, it's only in uh, special circumstances that we may relax the 14-day requirement. For example, during that period, um, there are contract disputes w between the FDH and the employers, and the FDH may have to go to the Reference Department or Tribunal to seek a mediation on, or, or redress. Then in those cases, we would consider them uh, case by case. And there are other exceptional cases that may lead to the relaxation of 14-day requirement, like in extreme cases. As I mentioned in the reply, uh, main reply, we will allow them to change employers. Otherwise, FTH must leave within 14 days. If they don't, then that means they have overstayed their visa, uh, so they will have to show their criminal liabilities. And if in future they apply to come and work to Hong Kong again, this would become an adverse record. And employers, in accordance with the obligations under the employment contract, must provide FDH with an air ticket. 
so uh, the FDA should go back to the places of origin. That's why it's best for, as I mentioned, for employers to give FDA a net ticket instead of cash. Otherwise, if you give cash, um, the problems you mentioned could happen. Because for many air tickets issued these days, they um, could not be returned. Um, but of course, for the discount tickets, um, the, even the, the dates of travel could not be changed. And I was just saying in my ring reply, if you give um, the FDH a an air ticket for which dates could not be changed, that could lead, be, lead to problem because the, the FDH may stay uh, here for 14 days. And so if um, the dates of travel and other conditions cannot be changed uh, for the air ticket, then um, maybe a new ticket would need to be issued if for some reason the FDH could not travel on the date specified. And But if you give the FDH a ticket, an air ticket, uh, um, the, he, he, they cannot get cash out of it, even if uh, for whatever reasons they don't use it. The 14-day uh, period was actually challenged. When we introduced this new initiative, there was a judicial review. The Court of First Instance and the Court of Appeal had the case, and the Court of Appeal allowed, gave leave for the, the case to be taken to the Privy Council. And for that case, on the 27th of June 1988, the Privy Council made a ruling. That is, um, uh, the new policy of requiring FDH to leave within 40 days upon the com termination of contract was uh, lawful and uh, reasonable. So that's why we continue with this policy. Of course, there were different views on the two-week uh, requirement, but uh, on our part, we believe this requirement has struck the right balance between the interests of employers and FDH. And where there are any irregularities, this is an effective regulation over these irregularities. Mr. Frankie, I don't think the uh, Secretary has answered my question. Thank you, uh, Secretary, for giving us so much information. But what I was saying is, uh, is about giving the FDH an etiquette. We were, we're talking about collaboration with the, the intermediaries. Uh, although they can't change um, the ticket for money, there's still you couldn't stop the stop, uh, job hopping because they still get money from other sources, Secretary. Now, we are require the FDH to leave Hong Kong within 14 days. In other words, whatever happens, they have to leave Hong Kong. And in my re reply, I m mentioned that if they apply to come back to Hong Kong, we would check. Actually, if they've actually left Hong Kong, if they have not, then we wouldn't issue them with the visas. So the objective of the policy is that uh, if uh, for some reason the contract could not be fulfilled or um, upon the completion of the contract, there's a reasonable period for them to stay in Hong Kong, 14 days, and that's our policy objective. Now, and what Mr. Frankie Yick said, uh, whether that could happen. For, uh, now, for the relevant FTH, they still have to le leave Hong Kong during that period. It's about an immigration control. We allow someone to come into Hong Kong upon the completion of the contract, and, and if they don't get permission from the Director of Immigration, they cannot stay in Hong Kong. This is the power we have given to the Director of Immigration, and, uh, and as a result, uh, this policy has been formulated. Dr. Priscilla Leung, President for Intermediaries or the Bad Apples, of course we must um, stop them. Now, when FDH come to Hong Kong, they abuse the system to try to gain some benefits. We've heard one reason is because uh, the first day they came here, they are already under heavy debt. Now, Hong Kong may charge less. Intermediaries may not charge more than, say, $400. But in their place of origin, there is a fee of some six months of the wages. So over $10,000. When my FDH first told me, I couldn't believe it. So my question for the administration is this. In this respect, can you talk to uh, countries um, where, from where the um, FDH can come from? Can you reach some sort of agreement with them so intermediaries may not uh, be allowed to reap um, such um, exorbitant benefits from these cases? 
Secretary for Labor and Welfare. Well, your, uh, we share your concerns, been our concern for a long time. We want to address the issue at source. That is, before they leave the country, say in the case of Indonesia, before they leave Indonesia, already they are under heavy debt because they have to pay for the recruitment fees and the training fees. Now, we've done a lot of work, and some time ago, um, the Indonesian authorities have already reduced the fee uh, by some uh, some extent. It was $18,000, now it's $13,000, and added that interest. So for the first six months, uh, FDH actually worked for no pay, in effect. So every time when I have a chance to meet with the Minister of Labour of Indonesia, I uh, convey my concerns to him. And we've also been reflecting the issues to the relevant uh, authorities. So we try to address the issue at source. Uh, we believe the in the recruitment fees and the training fees should be uh, reduced to minimum, so their own nationals don't have to show the such heavy debts just because they are coming uh, out of the country to work. Uh, I recently actually um, talked to the minister who visits Hong Kong. I suggested a very bold idea that is that perhaps the government could provide a loan to the, the FDH. So FDH don't have to borrow from the intermediaries or recruitment agencies. Uh, for the, the government, if it gives out loans to FDH, perhaps the loan could be repaid over a longer period at, an, at a lower interest rate, like um, a student's um, assistance and so on. But anyway, the, the, the minister has agreed to consider it, but uh, we agree we need to address the issue at source. Dr. Helena Wong. Abuse of FTH reveals a lot of problems. The government hasn't done enough in regulating intermediaries. There are just four inspectors doing the inspections. I don't know how you could bring about improvement. Now, our concern is for employers of HDH, you know, in the context of this question, is about what protection could you give to employers of FDH. But we haven't heard any effective measures. Dr. Wong, please come to your question, your specific question. Now, uh, we haven't heard any effective measures that could uh, prevent job hopping. So what means that, uh, is that, Dr. Helena, please do not just make comments. Please come to your question. Now, my question is, you just look at the exit point, and you don't check where they go to. So is that a loophole? So that's why FDH could just go to Macau or Shenzhen and still engage in job hopping. Secretary for Security, President, in, under the Immigration Ordinance, anyone is free to leave Hong Kong unless uh, there's any restriction imposed. Now, FDH by law, is a Hong Kong resident, although um, they not a permanent Hong Kong resident. So FDH uh, given protection of the basic law, they are allowed, entitled to free movement. We can't say that they can only leave Hong Kong to a particular place, like their place of origin. If we do so, uh, it is not permitted under the law. So upon the termination of contract between the FDH and employers, we cannot require the FTX to go back to the place of origin or to a certain pl to any particular place. Now, under the law, there's no overstaying of the visa condition. Um, the FTX go to any places is out of the free will and is permitted because the law protects everyone in Hong Kong and that they can enjoy a freedom of movement. We spend more than 24 minutes on this question. Next, question five. Mr. Wong Kok-heng, Mr. President, it is learned that quite a number of taxi drivers offering discounts on taxi fares, commonly known as the discount gangs, place several smartphones on the dashboards of the taxis to facilitate communication with passengers who need taxi call service. Such taxi drivers use mobile phones by touching or sweeping the screens of their mobile phones with their fingertips whilst driving operating mobile phones with fingertips. Many members of the taxi trade and passengers have expressed concern that as it is easy for the driver to get distracted under such circumstances, traffic accidents are prone to occur, posing danger to taxi passengers and other road users. 
the road traffic traffic control regulations, however, only prohibit drivers from using a mobile phone by holding it in their hands or between their heads and shoulders while driving, but not from operating mobile phones with fingertips while driving. Nor is there any restriction on the number of mobile phones which may be placed by a driver on the dashboard of a vehicle. In this connection, will the government inform this council one of the respective numbers of taxi drivers prosecuted in the past three months for offering fare discounts to passengers and for using mobile phones while driving? Two. In each of the past five years, of the number of taxi drivers who were convicted within the same year for using mobile phones while driving and offering fare discounts to passengers, the number of traffic accidents involving taxis which occurred when their drivers were using mobile phones and whether police officers were deployed to disguise as customers, commonly known as undercover operations, for taking law enforcement actions against discount gangs? If so, of the number of taxi drivers arrested during undercover operations? And three, whether the authorities stepped up law enforcement actions in the past three months against taxi drivers placing several mobile phones on the dashboard and of the number of such taxi drivers prosecuted for careless driving, whether the authorities will consider amending the legislation to stipulate the maximum permitted numbers of mobile phones to be placed on the dashboard and used by the driver so as to enable police officers, members of the taxi trade and other drivers to act in accordance with the law. If they will, of the legislative timetable, including consultation with the taxi trade, Secretary for Transport and Housing, Mr. President, my reply to the various parts of the question made, raised by the Honourable Mr. Wong Kwok Hing is as follows: One, according to the soliciting behaviour prescribed under Regulation 40 of the Road Traffic Public Service Vehicles Regulations, if any taxi driver or his or her representative in any manner attracts or endeavours to attract any person in order to induce such person to make use of his or her vehicle, he or she commits an offence and is liable to a fine of ten thousand dollars and imprisonment for six months. Any taxi driver who offers fair discounts or his or her own initiative to induce passengers to make use of his or her vehicle is engaging in soliciting sitting activities. Separately, under Regulation 42 1G of the Road Traffic Traffic Control Regulations, a driver shall not, if a motor vehicle being driven by him is in motion, use a mobile telephone while holding it in his hand or between his head or shoulder. Offenders are liable to a fine of $2,000. Based on the information provided by the police, the respective numbers of taxi drivers prosecuted for soliciting and using mobile phones while holding them in their hands or between their heads and so shoulders while driving from October to December 2013 are set out and annexed. Two, the police have all along been taking vigorous enforcement actions against taxi malpractices through various operations. They include having police officers disguising as passengers, commonly known as undercover operations, to combat soliciting activities by taxi drivers. The police, however, do not maintain figures on these operations or on the related arrests. Apart from law enforcement, the Transport Department from time to time reminds the taxi trade of the need to abide by the law. It also reminds passengers through publicity that they should pay taxi fares according to the meter as required by the law. The police do not have figures on prosecution and conviction of taxi drivers who have committed both offences of using mobile phones while holding them in their hands while driving and solic soliciting in the same year. The police also do not have figures on traffic accidents involving taxis which occurred when their drivers were using mobile phones by holding them in their hands. 3. As mentioned above, there are legal provisions prohibiting the use of mobile phone by a driver while holding it in his hand or between his head and shoulder while driving. A driver may, depending on the actual circumstances of a case, commit an offence of dangerous driving or careless driving under the Road Traffic Ordinance. 
if his driving at behavior is adversely affected or caused traffic accident by his using mobile phone or other telecommunications equipment through swiping. Simply placing of mobile phones on the dashboard does not contravene any legislation, provided that driving safety is not undermined. It is our preliminary understanding that the regulatory framework on the use of mobile phones by drivers during driving in major developed countries is similar to the ones adopted in Hong Kong. In countries like the USA, Canada, Germany, France, UK, Japan and Singapore, there are legal provisions prohibiting the use of handheld mobile phones by drivers while driving. Such provisions do not prohibit the use of mobile phones through hands-free devices or the operation of a mobile phone through swiping. From the road safety perspective, drivers should avoid being distracted while driving. As such, it is not advisable to use mobile phones or other telecommunications equipment while driving. However, taking into account the practical needs of drivers, such as to make phone calls in case of emergency and necessary situations, the current legislation only prohibits the use of handheld mobile phone or holding the phone between one's head and shoulder while driving. The mobile phones has become very popular. Increasingly, the public opt to place hiring orders for taxi or goods vehicle services through mobile phone application software. We agree that current legislation should keep pace with the latest development and be reviewed from time to time, having regard to the technological advancement and risk assessment. If the community consider considers it necessary to explore the practicability of further tightening up the control over the use of mobile phones while driving, we have to carefully assess its impact on drivers, not only taxi drivers, but also all commercial vehicles and other drivers. Also, we have to consider the enforcement and the related issues in order to strike a right balance among road safety, social needs and the use of technology. Having regard to the community's concern about the use of mobile phones and other telecommunications equipment by drivers while driving, the government will collect and analyse relevant information, such as the correlation between the use of mobile phones through swiping and the number of mobile phones placed inside vehicles against the occurrence of traffic accidents. I have already tasked the police to start collecting data regarding the number of mobile phones or telecommunications equipment placed in vehicles involved in traffic accidents with personal injuries for further analysis. At the same time, we will continue to monitor the relevant overseas research findings and legal requirements. We will also work closely with the Road Safety Council to enhance the education and publicity work and will invite the Council to study the issue further. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Wong Kok Heng. Mr. President, today, before the uh, Lechko's meeting today, the uh, Association um, the, gen, uh, the general union of taxi drivers or transportation um, drivers, they urge the administration to amend the legislation to plug the loophole. In relation to part three of the secretary's main reply, he clearly admits that the number of tele mobile phones placed on the dashboard at the moment and the operation of a mobile phone th through swiping are not subject to any legal control. That means that means there is no prohibition at all and no control at all. And in the last part of Secretary's reply, data will be collected and analyzed to find out the correlation between this issue and the occurrence of traffic accidents. So my question is, unless there are fatal accidents, no, nothing will be done. Is the administration going to wait until somebody dies from an accident before the law is amended, before a timetable for legislative amendments can be set out? There is nothing in the third part of your main reply. So my question is, are you going to wait for traffic uh, fatal accidents to occur? Secretary. Of course, we don't wish to see any fatal traffic accidents. As we mentioned in the main reply, we understand the community's concern about traffic and road safety. And there are provisions uh, in the law regulating um, the um, uh, against uh, uh, careless or dangerous driving. But drawing reference from other advanced economies, 
there are legal provisions prohibiting the use of handheld mobile phones through um, by holding it in hand or placing it between the heads and shoulders, but nothing. Uh, uh, although her prohibition, um, there is no prohibition on the use of mobile phones through hands-free devices or through swiping, and we understand that it is uh, getting more and more prevalent. And we are going to look carefully and assess the impacts. But we need to um, find a causal link, and uh, we need to analyze the data first. That is why I have tasked the police to start collecting data for uh, general analysis, and we need to understand. That if we are to impose prohibitions, we do not only impose it on taxi drivers but on all commercial drivers and uh, other general drivers. Mr. Wong Ting Kong, according to recent media reports, there are taxi drivers using communication um, apps to form a team to get more passengers. My question is, is this against the law? If it is, how can the administration effectively combat such illegal activities? Secretary, as mentioned in my main reply under the existing legislation, any taxi driver, whether by himself or through his or her representative, solicit and induce the passengers to make use of his or her vehicles, including offering discounts, is against the law. And we often advise passengers to pay taxi fares according to the meter as required by the law. Your question hasn't been answered? Right, Mr. President, I am not saying uh, that uh, the issue of discounts is not mentioned. My point is they use apps to form uh, uh, to team up so if they pay taxi fa fares or charge taxi fares according to the meter is it against the law secretary under the existing legislation we permit dr taxi drivers to um take higher service from passengers and for example, if they use uh, mobile phone applications um, and then uh, get passengers' appointments through such mobile phones, and as long as uh, taxi fares are charged according to the meter, it's not against the law. Mr. Frankie Yick. Mr. President, the taxi trade is uh, very concerned about this issue because it has to do with road safety. Mr. Wong Kwok Hing asked whether the legislation will be amended to Stipulate the maximum permitted numbers of mobile phones to be placed on the dashboard and used by the driver. And Secretary said that uh, so far no advanced uh, countries have legal provisions prohibiting, prohibiting such. And uh, I like to talk about my experience. I was in a taxi and there were six mobile phones on the dashboard. And then the uh, taxi driver took a, a business order and he then um, pencil down the name, uh, etc. And then I asked the driver to stop because it was dangerous. And uh, te the taxi driver said, why uh, um, have I breached any law? And I don't know how to answer. How should I answer next time, Secretary? Under the existing legislation, there is no prohibition for a taxi driver to use a mobile phone other than placing it uh, between his head and shoulders or holding it in his hand. However, if the operation of the mobile phone is such that it constitutes uh, dangerous driving or cause risk to road safety, then uh, that's another uh, matter. But there are media reports and there are um, discussions in the community on the um, taxi drivers using many mobile phones, and there is, if there is a request for the maximum uh, permitted numbers of mobile phones to be placed on dashboards, and of course we need to consider <coughs> how it will affect the the drivers' uh, driving conduct. And uh, of course we need to collect data first and analyze the situation and find out in relation to traffic accidents, the role 
uh, played by or whether there is a strong correlation between the use of mobile phones. Mr. Tankapil. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, the taxi trade and taxi drivers think that if fair discounts cannot be offered to passengers, they'd rather um, suspend work because uh, it because placing mobile phones on the dashboard is uh, directly linked to offering this fair discounts. Now, uh, especially in the night shifts. The situation is very prevalent. Have you considered how many taxi drivers have given up their work in the night shift because of the uh, prevalence of discount gangs? <clears throat> because um, many passengers uh, have made appointments with these uh, discount gangs instead. Secretary, Mr. President, the police have all along um, been taking enforcement actions, including undercover operations, to combat the um, illegal activities of, of um, taxi drivers, including um, charging extra taxi fares or soliciting passengers, and such soliciting behavior is illegal. In 2008, we amended the um, laws in relation to taxi fares. And uh, that for sh short journeys, uh, there was an increase. For longer journeys, there was a reduction in taxi fares. And since the amendment, the um, tax uh, discount gangs, so to speak, um, was uh, less prevalent. I can't say that it has been eradicated, but uh, we will closely monitor the situation, and we uh, often advise the taxi driver to charge taxi fares according to the meter as required by the law. We advise the passengers the same. Now, my question hasn't been answered. Uh, have you noticed uh, uh, how many taxi drivers have given up uh, driving night shifts as a result of this problem? We don't have statistics on the um, number of taxi drivers uh, working in the night sh shift. And now, to supplement, for taxi drivers prosecuted for soliciting. In 2011, we had 27 cases. In 2012, 51 cases. 2013, 156. So from the statistics, you can see that um, police uh, enforcement action have indeed been stepped up. Mr. Yu Si Wing, apart from misusing mobile phone, and soliciting. There are also other illegal behavior of uh, taxi drivers, including charging extra taxi fares and uh, charging um, um, uh, extra um, uh, and stealing luggages from uh, passengers. So, Secretary, what measures do you have in curbing such illegal behavior? And will you take the opportunity to amend the law? Mr. President, on charging extra tax taxi fares and or overcharging taxi fares and uh, luggage fares, we have a very clear penalty under the law. And I recall in the past I replied to uh, some relevant questions in this council, and the police are very concerned uh, whether this is an increasing trend and for tourists. Whether taxi drivers um, um, make a detour to charge extra fares, etc., because of um, because the tourists are um, not familiar with Hong Kong, and the police have stepped up their operation, and the uh, transport department uh, have also stepped up publicity, and will also closely monitor the situation and, in, uh, where necessary, uh, review whether the existing legislation is uh, for is uh, sufficient. Now. Um, the uh, 20 discount uh, taxi gang uh, has caused the whole taxi trade to suffer, and the administration has not effectively combat this issue, and the whole taxi trade continues to suffer. Mr. Wong Kwok Heng suggests that the maximum number of permitted mobile phones, uh, permitted number of mobile phones, should on the dashboard should be regulated, and in fact, 
and in the same taxi there could be eight. Uh, or even ten mobile phones, and they are the ringleader of the taxi gangs. As the uh, mobile phones of, um, would obstruct their views on the dashboard and even on the road, and because the driver's conduct and the driving behavior would be affected, would it be dangerous enough um, so as to call for legislation to be amended rather than data to be collected? Mr. Kwok, please be concise and succinct in raising your question. Please ask your question once. My question is this. Mobile phones placed on the dashboard and in front of the windscreen would already obstruct the driver's view and would cause danger. Can this be a sufficient reason uh, for legislation to be stepped up? I hope members would refrain from putting long questions. Secretary, now, the taxi driver, as I said in the main reply, if engaged in soliciting behavior by offering fair discounts, would be uh, against the law whether or not mobile phones are used or whether or not how many mobile phones are used. But we are also concerned about the use of mobile phones and road safety on how to define um, whether and, and decide uh, when to impose a control where safety is at stake at present. There is no prohibition on the use of hands-free devices or operating phones through swiping. Maybe uh, due to uh, uh, technological develop development sometimes in the future, uh, we could give uh, oral commands to mobile phones instead of using our hands. So uh, it depends on technological developments and will assess the risks uh, where necessary. Of course, if there are many mobile phones on the dashboard and taxi drivers uh, will get distracted, uh, but in terms of legislation, we have to be very uh, prudent. We need to look at the causal link and also look at the, the overseas experience. We've sent, spent over 23 minutes on this question. The last oral question, Mr. Lang Chi Chen. Thank you, Mr. President. It has been reported that the prices of Aquilarias and lenses, incense trees, and endangered species, and the resin secreted, secreted by them have been rising incessantly in recent years, resulting in many cases of illegal felling and theft of incense trees in Hong Kong. For instance, more than a hundred incense trees at Pa and Heng. Lantau have all been failed in the past few years. It is learned that the lawbreakers first make cuts on the trunks of incense trees to stimulate secretion of resin and then return to collect the resin and fail the trees for profit. In this connection, will the government inform this council first of the number of incense trees illegally failed in the past five years? If such figure is not available of the reasons for that, while the government has indicated that a territory-wide survey for incense trees is neither practicable nor useful, whether the authorities will consider afresh collecting such data to facilitate formulation of a policy for better protection of incense trees. Second, of the number of persons arrested for illegal felling of incense trees in the past five years and the highest penalty imposed on the convicted persons, whether the government will increase the penalty for illegal felling of trees so as to enhance the deterrent effect, as cases of illegal felling of incense trees happen time and again, whether the authorities have reviewed the effectiveness of the relevant protection measures, whether it has made reference to the measures taken, legislation enacted and the penalties imposed by overseas authorities for curbing similar cases, if it has all the details. And third, whether it has considered restoring the damaged habitats of incense trees, including the planting of incense tree seedlings, if it has not all the reasons for that. Secretary for the Environment. 
Mr. President, on the different parts of the question raised by Honorable Mr. Leung, our reply is as follows. Chenxiang is a valuable traditional Chinese medicine derived mostly from incense trees growing in the Asian tropics. The incense tree growing in Hong Kong belongs to another species of the genus Aquilaria. It produces a resin that has been used as a spiritual of Chenxiang. The native incense tree is widely distributed in Hong Kong and mostly found in lowland broadleaf forests or in feng shui woods behind rural villages. The Agriculture, Fisheries and Conservation Department, FCD, does not maintain a record of the population of incense trees in Hong Kong. Under the Forests and Countryside Ordinance, Cap 96, any person who unlawfully fails or destroys any trees or green plants on government land is liable on conviction to a fine of $25,000 and imprisonment for one year. Depending on the circumstances of individual cases, the, policy, the police may initiate prosecutions under the Theft Ordinance Cap 210. Which imposes a heavier penalty in a bid to achieve a stronger deterrent effect. If a person arrested and charged with theft is liable to a maximum penalty of imprisonment for 10 years. Currently, offenders involved in illegal felling of incense tree were mainly prosecuted for criminal offenses on theft, criminal damage, possession of offensive weapon, going equipped for stealing, etc. And where appropriate, the police may apply for an enhancement of sentence under the Organized and Serious Crimes Ordinance, Cap 455. Over the past five years, 2009 to 2013, the maximum penalty convicted involving incense tree is four years and three months imprisonment. Detailed information on recent criminal cases handled by the police involving incense trees is provided in Table 1. All Equalaria species, including the native incense tree, are Appendix 2 species under the Protection of Endangered Species of Animals and Plants Ordinance, Cap 586. Under the ordinance, any person could export an agarwood speci specimen or possesses a live plant of wide origin for commercial purposes must obtain a permit issued by the FCD while the import of an agarwood specimen requires a valid export license issued by the exporting country. The maximum penalty for violation of the licensing requirements of Appendix 2 species under the ordinance is a fine of $500,000 and imprisonment for one year. In the past five years, there were 17 cases of seizure of illegal imports and exports of agarwood specimens. FCD will closely liaise and cooperate with the police in combating against illegal felling or pruning of incense tree. Imposing a heavier penalty on such illegal activities could also provide a stronger deterrence and enhance the protection of incense trees. Patrols will also be stepped up at sites of illegal tree felling. Thirdly, many of the illegally felled areas are already are already densely vegetated, and in addition, some of the areas fall within private lots. As such, it may not be appropriate for the government to replant incense trees in those areas. We find it more appropriate to plant the seedlings of incense trees as select suitable sites within the country parks. The FCD would produce seedlings of incense trees and plant them in country parks to assist in the propagation of these species in Hong Kong. The number of seedlings planted in the recent years is as shown in Table 2, almost approaching 10,000 per year. Protection of endangered species in Hong Kong, including the incense tree, relies on the concerted effort of the public and the government of Hong Kong. I would also like to appeal to the public to reduce the purchase and use of incense tree and its products, uh, including villages and the hikers. If um, you um, see any illegal tree felling, you are advised to report such cases to the police as soon as possible. This will help the police in taking actions in combating such illegal activities. Thank you. Mr. Lang Chi Chen, Mr. President, well, in fact, the incense trees are very uh, precious, variable, and in fact, they are closely related to our native plant species. All along, 
the government has been paying attention to this matter, and I understand that law enforcement has been taken against the lawbreakers, but then it is not effective at all. My understanding from the villagers is that for the law enforcement agencies to arrest such illegal uh, uh, offenders, Usually, what happens is that they try to see if they are in possession of offensive weapons or going equipped for stealing. So, for many years, trees have been felled and then no arrests have been made or can be made. But re it resulted in um, huge damages to the incense trees. So, my question for the Secretary for the Environment, I would like to know whether you are going to cooperate with other departments like the Police, in particular the Marine Police, as well as the FCD, so that you can set up an interdepartmental working group so as to provide protection to this endangered species. Secretary, Mr. President, I would like to thank Mr. Leung for his question. The government does take the matter seriously, that is, the protection of incense trees. Looking at the figures in the past, for the past three years, uh, between 2011 and 2013, as to the number of cases involved, well, on average, we have 60 to 90 such cases. Among them, in the year 2011, 65 persons were arrested, and then 64 in 2012, and then 41 in 2013. Um, in year 2011, 28 cases successfully prosecuted, 29 cases in 2012, 21 cases being dealt with in 2013. And then um, for the imprisonment term, it ranged between two years and four years. So uh, you can have an idea about the number of successful prosecution. It is not on the low side, but we will continue to step up the action. Um, both our bureau and the uh, AFCD would continue to join efforts. Mr. Tam Yu Chung. According to the SEN, it is said that the government attaches importance to the work of protection. Will the SEN um, consider the following? That is, set up a database to protect the species. Are you going to step up the patrol so as to combat illegal felling of trees? And do you have plans to do this on a gradual basis by stages so that you will have replanting of the species um, in areas where the trees have been felled? Secretary, I would like to thank Mr. Tam for his question. Basically, for the FCD, in relation to the various uh, related species, we do have a database. Uh, different groups, including schools, have been visiting the relevant facility so as to allow members of the public to have an understanding of our work. As to the work of the FCD, the AFCD and the police would judge the circumstances and try to enhance their action. As to the case of replanting, I've already referred to this in my main reply. Um, in recent years, a lot of the illegal felling took place behind villages within private lots, and they are already densely vegetated at the time, at the uh, moment. It will be difficult to do the replanting. Generally speaking, within the country parks, uh, it is more appropriate in the circumstances of Hong Kong to find suitable sites in country parks to replant the incense trees. And we have been planting almost 10,000 seedlings uh, at different spots in Hong Kong so as to make sure that we have got quite a large number of incense trees in Hong Kong. Mr. Albert Chen, Mr. President. Well, the felling of the incense trees is mainly because the lawbreakers would like to get the resin from the incense trees for medicinal purposes. So there is a particular timing for the felling of trees. Generally speaking, they would try to make cuts on the trees so that the, there will be secretion of the resin. And then three or five months later, they will come to get the resin. And it will cost, it, it can fetch a price between 50 and $100,000. 
for the lawbreakers, I think the government should come up with a um, response plan. So I think we should bear in mind the process involved. Are you going to design and make use of advanced technology? Uh, sometimes they have already made cuts on the trees, so they've already planned their action well in advance. Is it possible for us to install an alarm system so as to make immediate arrests? In this way, we can uh, control the illegal uh, felling of incense trees, and we can also catch the lawbreakers. So would you consider coming up with an action plan to arrest those lawbreakers who are felling the trees illegally? Secretary, I'd like to thank Mr. Chen for his question. Over the past few years, a similar idea has been raised by lawmakers, and we did pay, pay attention to that and studied the idea. Well, the incense trees are spread all over Hong Kong, so it is difficult to make use of technology to do the work. And then, in the past, for the incense trees, lawbreakers would damage the trees so as to make sure that from the cuts there will be the secretion of resin. That was the practice in the past, but recently it has changed. Uh, this is because the lawbreakers would know that we are stepping up our patrol and so it will be more difficult for them to do the felling. So they have changed their mode and they would just go to various places and they will simply cut off the branches from the trees. In other words, they don't do any preparatory work. So they know that we are stepping up our patrol and the illegal acts are swifter and also more organized. So things are very fluid and we're watching the development. Making good use of technology was an idea raised in the past since the trees are distributed over a huge area and we are not sure about the effectiveness of the installation of technological devices. We are increasing the penalties and we are paying special attention to uh, important sites and we appeal to the villages and also the uh, country park uh, visitors or hikers to report cases to us so that the police can act on them. It is effective. Mr. President, I was asking the Secretary to consider my idea. Dozens of incense trees have been felled, and 20 meters from my home there was an incense tree being felled. Now, indeed, some lawbreakers cut off the branches from the incense trees, but the many of them targeted at those 30, 40 years old, and then they would make cuts on the trees so as to get the resin, because it is the resin that would fetch a value. So you can simply uh, install some simple devices. Sorry, Mr. Chen. I think your question and your suggestion have been heard by the Secretary, but he re refused um, to take it uh, up. If you're not happy with the Secretary's uh, reply, you can follow this up on other occasions. I hope the Secretary can uh, consider it in greater details because I'm familiar with the situation. Make sure that uh, we do not become the city where incense trees are all failed. Um, Mr. Lo Wai Kwok, Mr. President, um, Chen Xiang is valuable and therefore the incense trees have been felt and has caused concern. I support the government's efforts to plant incense trees in our country parks, as the Sen has already explained. Uh, we have many other variable plant species in addition to uh, incense trees. We have got other um, trees as well, and some of them have become uncommon. So I want to know if the administration has got a plan to plant um, native species that are available all over Hong Kong. Can a written supply be given? Mr. President, I'd like to thank Mr. Lowe for his question. Recently, I've talked to the FCD colleagues. Other than incense trees, other trees which used to be commonly found in Hong Kong and yet 
has been reduced in number? Should they be sort of uh, become the subject matter of new action plans? Say, for example, we should sort of give a more positive response to such ideas in our country parks. We are still working on it, and we'll come back with an answer. Mr. Paul Chair. Thank you, Mr. President. According to the main reply, the same has told us that yes, we do have the forest and countryside ordinance that would talk about the felling of trees. It's difficult to gather the evidence. Another piece of legislation relevant is the protection of endangered species of animals and plants ordinance, but that would only involve import and export of the um, species. Uh, just like the case of uh, shooting um, movies or taking pictures uh, from under somebody's uh, skirt, uh, we don't have a piece of specific legislation against it. You have to count on loitering. Now, the administration has told us that there was one case which fetched a penalty of four years and three months imprisonment. Probably that was on the high side. What about the average penalty? Is it necessary to change the law so as to raise the maximum penalty? Secretary, I would like to thank the member for his question. Basically, for illegal felling of trees, um, I think it is very much organized in relation to the felling activities because the instance trees or the acre wood uh, can fetch a good value. Uh, recently, we have been taking out prosecutions under the theft ordinance. In 2013, um, there were 96 cases. 41 persons were arrested among whom about 10 cases had had the hearing completed and the prosecution was successful. The minimum imprisonment was two years, the maximum almost four years. And that's the latest trend. And such penalties are higher than what we used to get in the past. So an imprisonment of a term between two and four years reflects the importance that we attach to such matters. Mr. Porche. According to the figures, Mr. President, of course, in 2013, we have the highest number of cases, and then it covered 168 um, trees. Um, but we can see that things are getting more and more serious. And yet the government claims that uh, it has got effective policies and the penalties are deterrent in fact, but I cannot agree. The Sen was merely reading out from the answer again. My question is, are you going to amend the law so as to target a possession so that um, the police doesn't have to rely on the theft ordinance? Secretary, I would like to thank Mr. Chair for his follow-up question. We do understand that uh, as um, the interest trees can fetch a value and also the prices are going up, therefore the number of illegal felling cases has increased. Uh, it is something that we understand and we take the matter seriously. The FCD and the police are stepping up their inspection, uh, law enforcement, as well as public education. We have to understand that the Asian trees are spread all over Hong Kong, and therefore, even though we have stepped up our patrol and law enforcement work, the lawbreakers can uh, still try to outwit us, and that's where the difficulty lies. Um, when we look at the existing legislation, we believe that they are still deterrent uh, to a certain extent. An imprisonment term of between two and four years is not on the low side. Um, we hope that the penalties can reflect the um, importance, the weight that we attach to such cases. We hope that the courts can uh, meet out the sentences accordingly. And in fact, um, we can also invoke CAP 455, Organized and Serious Crimes Ordinance, to apply to the court for an enhancement of sentence. So in this way, we can step up the deterrent effect. That's all for the oral questions. Bills. This council resumes the second reading debate of the stamp duty amendment bill 2012. The